saving God, your salvation is so much more than just forgiveness of sin. Your salvation means that we are saved from ourselves. That being our sometimes misguided way of life. Your salvation allows us to return to you triumphant, knowing we are loved. Help us during these last days of Lent to discover what it means to love our God and how that leads us to love our neighbor as we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have to preface this sermon today because today's sermon are, is going to include things that you've probably never heard before. And then sometimes it might seem a little bit confusing, so I'm going to try to be as clear as possible. But what I will tell you is that this literally is a seminary lesson. So you're receiving the same lesson that I received in seminary. Now today we, we recall in our scriptures how Jesus enters on a cult into Jerusalem. And he literally fulfills the scriptures by doing this. He's not on a war horse, which is what a king normally would come into Jerusalem on. He's coming on a horse and showing his power, a huge stallion. But rather, Jesus comes in on a colt or a donkey, which is a horse of peace, a beast of burden, a servant beast. It's an indicator that he, in fact, is the Messiah, the Blessed One of God. And for all the people who see him coming into Jerusalem, they are thrilled and ecstatic because here comes the new King of the Jews, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who is going to kick the Romans out of Jerusalem and give them freedom from their oppressors. What a wonderful opportunity. In five days, the whole thing turns upside down. Well, Jesus knows that he is going into a no-win situation. He knows that there are two possible scenarios that could happen by him accepting the role of Messiah, the Blessed One of God. The first is that, in fact, he takes on the role of Messiah, the new king of the Jews, and it becomes and leads to a completely, really messy, messy situation. I mean, there could be a possible rebellion. There's lots of deaths between the Romans and the Jews. The Romans obviously are not going to be happy at all that this person comes in and, and rabble-rouses all the Jews to get up and form an army to fight and rebel against them. Herod the king certainly is not going to be very happy because he's going to lose his throne to this upstart, this smart aleck prophet out of Galilee. So he's not happy. And then you have the Pharisees. The Pharisees certainly don't want a Messiah. I mean, they've got a really good right now. I mean, they've got a very high exchange rate for the Roman denarii, so they get their temple coins. And, of course, they're allowing the vendors to go into the temple, and they get a little piece, a little cut of, the, of their, their profits there. Because remember, when Jesus goes in and throws all the vendors out, they're getting a little bit of money there. So they're, they're making lots of money. They are the leaders of the town, and they are high society. This new guy coming in is only going to just mess this whole thing up for everybody. It literally becomes a suicide mission from a spiritual standpoint. Because even though he is, in fact, said to be the king of the Jews, he has the Romans, he's got the Pharisees, and he's got King Herod all against him. So even if he does start a rebellion, it doesn't look like it's going to be a very, very good one. The second option that could happen is that he could get arrested and in fact, killed. Which, as we all know, is exactly what happens. He goes in, and as 
has this new Messiah, the king, the Romans go in and they arrest him, or actually the Pharisees arrest him first. They try him for heresy and for blasphemy, and they sentence him to death, but they can't do that. So they turn it over to the Romans. This is literally a political suicide. Political suicide. He's walking into something he knows is not going to go well. But he knows that in the second option, there are some benefits. You see, he knows that by going this route of accepting God's call to become the Messiah, to be the Messiah, and take on this role, he knows that he is showing unyielding devotion and a true example of what it means to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and all your strength what is known in the Jewish religion as the Shema. And there's also unshakable proof. He knows that if, even if he does die, he knows that he's going to be resurrected. So, there is unshakable proof that resurrection is real. Now, we have to remember that the Pharisees believe in resurrection, but there's another group of high religious leaders, whether they're more political but they're called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees said, there is no such thing as resurrection. You die and you die, and that's all there is to it. But the Pharisees said, yeah, there is. Well, if Jesus dies, there's unshakable truth that resurrection is real. Eternal life is available to us. Christ is 100% human and 100% divine. So now we have to remember that in this scenario, it could have played out where Jesus, in fact, survived. And a, and a literal religious war breaks out. And Jesus is commanding one side of the forces and is attempting to bring unity through a peaceful means. Or he could be killed. Now, Jesus knows that his life is in danger when he goes into Jerusalem. There is a real possibility if not a great probability, that he in fact will be killed. And of course, we all know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. You see, Jesus is going in on a mission, the same as our military does, when they go into a mission where the probability is high that they're not going to return. There's a probability that many, if not most of them, are going to be killed. It's called a suicide mission. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. There is no guarantee that Christ is going to come out of this alive, and there's no guarantee that he's going to come out of it dead. It could go either way. So what does it say about salvation for us? I mean, we've, we've banked our entire faith on the fact that our sins are forgiven by Jesus going to the cross, right? I mean, the didn't Christ go to the cross so that we would have forgiveness of sin? No. No. <laughs> Jesus did not exactly go to the cross just for the forgiveness of our sins or even for the forgiveness of our sins. We have been told in Sunday school for years that our sins are forgiven by God through the substitutionary theory of atonement. Where all of our sins, past, present, and future, are imputed on Christ. Christ is put onto the cross as a sacrifice for us. Well, now, if you consider that, that means that Jesus, as we know, is the Son of God, is God because John tells us that he was there in the beginning as in this creation of the earth. So it means that God literally committed suicide. He didn't just go on a suicide mission. He committed suicide. Now, you think Oh, for crying out loud, we just hired a heretic in our church. <laughs> no. This is the same argument that I used in my ordination exam. When I was ordained, I said, 
I think and I believe with my whole heart that God could have come up with a better plan than to commit suicide in order to forgive us of our sins. But I had to support my argument. And obviously, I am ordained, so I did. You see, seminarians have been taught this for the last 20 years. Pastors have been teaching, be, being taught this in seminaries all the time. But like I've told you in the past, they're afraid to come back and preach this that you have not been taught out in that you've been taught for 50 years in Sunday school. But the fact is, there are 10 theories of atonement. Atonement being forgiveness of sin. 10 theories of atonement. Peter Schmeichen, the president of Lancaster Theological Seminary, wrote a book and taught our class on the 10 theories of atonement. Ten different ways that we are forgiven of our sins in the Bible. You see, it's a lot harder for pastors to do the research and to teach a new concept than it is to preach the same old message that you've known and accepted all your life. That's easy. But to prove your case, to support your argument, and to help people understand that there are different theological ideas out there. Because, you know, it always haunted me. I mean, it just haunted me that God would kill God's self to grant us forgiveness. I mean, to me, that just didn't make any sense. If God is all-powerful, why in the world would God kill God's self? It wasn't until I got to seminary and was taught that there were ten theories of atonement and I was taught that in the Old Testament, God used animal sacrifices all the time. For thousands of years, God used animal sacrifices, everything from the unblemished lamb to pigeons. And in fact, God granted out and out forgiveness, no conditions. I will forgive their iniquities and I will forget their transgressions, says the Lord. We've already been granted forgiveness by God. Psalm 65, verse 3 says, When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgave our transgressions. You see, when we acknowledge and realize, yes, we have in fact messed up. When we acknowledge our sins and we take responsibility for the fact that we have not followed God's ways and we in fact have strayed from the narrow path, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. You see, the New Testament writers had a dilemma. Their Messiah, their King, was killed. And they had to explain that his death had to mean something. Now, Jesus comes back in the upper room in, in plain sight of them and is resurrected. But you see, his death has much more impact when he's died for the sins and that he committed, a, that rather than he committed political suicide. I mean, remember, see, in the Old Testament, Isaiah tells us that the Blessed One would be led like a lamb to slaughter. The New Testament writers knew that and said, I got it. The unblemished lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God. Like a lamb to slaughter. He is his death. That's why he died. He fulfills the scripture. But unfortunately, that's not what Isaiah was talking about. Isaiah was talking about the prophets who come to Jerusalem. The prophets that are killed in Jerusalem. Isaiah is warning the Jewish people to stop killing the anointed ones, the blessed ones who are come to Jerusalem with God's message, with God's word. Remember how Jesus says, Oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, 
the city that kills its prophets. How I wish I could gather its children as a hen gathers her brood under her wing. Remember that? We preached it not too long ago. Jesus uses those same words about Jerusalem. And Jesus goes to the cross knowing, voluntarily goes to the cross to show an ultimate love of God. He accepted the role of Messiah, even if it meant that he would die. He received his calling and he accepted it. He followed God's will for his life, even to the point of death, knowing, knowing though, that even in death, he would still win by demonstrating that resurrection is real and eternal life is in fact ours. You see, the real triumph of the story is that Jesus demonstrates to all humanity that the love of God, the love of God is the goal of life. Accepting our calling, you all have been given a calling by God. Will you Follow Christ's example? Will you mirror Christ's life? Accept your call from God? Will you use your spiritual gifts to help others? To show your appreciation to God and to help and love your neighbor as yourself? Will you mirror Jesus? You see, we know that we are forgiven when we acknowledge our sins. That's been told numerous times. And to even drive the point home harder, remember when Jesus is on the cross? What does he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He acknowledged for those. He acknowledged the sins for them. Why say that if his death is going, to, is going to forgive their sins anyway? Why do that? You see, they didn't realize what they were doing. They thought they were doing a lawful thing. So Jesus acknowledged their sins for them so that they can receive forgiveness right away. That, my friends, was before he died. Jesus acknowledges those sins and they are forgiven. And finally, Jesus knows that his death is not the final chapter of his life because he will live. And because he will live, we too will have everlasting life. You see, we spend way too much time on looking at the cross. It's too much guilt for us for our egos to handle, to know that our sins killed God? We don't spend enough time looking at Jesus' teachings, looking at the other side of the cross, looking at Easter morning. I mean, Jesus says, even a righteous man will lay down his life for a friend. But the real question is, will you die for God? See, when we spend more time on the Easter side than rather than the good side or the good Friday side of Christianity, we accept our calling. We accept the teachings of Christ. And we do what we've been called to do. So I ask you to let you wave your palm branch branches celebrating the true Messiah, the blessed one of God that shows us what loving God is all about and what being loved by God